notion of self-appointed uh, Not new in terms of American political history. Um, uh, trying to be convinced that the uniqueness and the intensity of, of, of President Obama as an example of this sacred six. Uh, for instance, the pictures, uh, this would seem to be that there would be other presidential candidates who would have been, however inadvertently, maybe not purposefully, you know, framed in that halo-like light. Any response to that? Is there, or is this a, a unique uh, and consistently uh, approached kind of framing for this president, as opposed to previous presidents? Yeah, from the research that I that I've done, it's really unique to Barack Obama. Um, you have, uh, for example, President Bush, when he was uh, in his second term, he did a dedication at Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas. And you saw some, some photos circulating with the cross in the background, Jesus is Lord. You can look at the current campaign where some of the candidates would be uh, in churches, particularly Rick Santorum. Yeah. Uh, Michelle Bachman, uh, Rick Perry, and you had some. You had that identification with uh, evangelical Christianity, but they, it wasn't this kind of. They weren't assuming this kind of persona, messianic persona. So there's there's a distinction I think between uh, being identified as you know with your Christian beliefs, and then um, the salvific persona that Barack Obama, I, I believe, carried uh, in, 2000, in 2008. Okay. Yeah. It's but amazing that, the, that they pulled it off so successfully. If it's true that others have used this type of approach, he certainly took it to the well, you know, next level. Oh, yeah. Well, you, this was, you, make, you make a terrific point. It's just, you we're always talking about timing, right? So what, what the Obama campaign did was uh, politics and advertising, they've, they've been wedded, you know, they've been wed together for 60 years, right? Ever since Eisenhower uh, answered America. You know, have you seen some of these old commercials? Uh, and, and Madison Avenue, you know, came in and began to just promote political candidates like they, like they would products. But what Barack Obama did, a uh, team Obama, you know, when I talk about Barack Obama, it's, we're not talking about a, a person, we're talking really about uh, you know, a team, and he's the front man for the team. Uh, but what Team Obama did was they brought in religion into the mix. Now, not religion in the sense that, you know, he was identified with the church or with a particular belief system, but religion in the sense that it's used in advertising. Uh, have you, I, I, you guys, have you gotten into the, like, the history of advertising a bit? Okay. Do you remember? Do you remember? Uh, let's see. You're, you're all in your in your early twenties, right? Okay. So around the time when you were born, if your mom if your mom was on a budget, she was buying her diapers and your baby formula in the generics aisle. And all of these shops had uh, the grocery stores had generics aisles where you'd walk down and everything was was in a white box or a white bag, and it had black printing across it, just like a stamp, and it was flour, uh, oatmeal baby food, you know, things like this. And it looked like it, it looked like suddenly you walked into the general store. And this got brand this got, got uh, companies really <coughs> nervous because they're, you know, these people were beating them on prices. These these generic brands were beating them on prices. And you basically got the same product because by that point, you know, everything got your every every laundry detergent got your clothes white. You know, and and uh, food you know, flour was flour. It, 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 you used it for baking, and, and there was no real quality difference. So, the age of the generics made advertisers and the uh, these big companies, the big the big companies, really nervous. So their response was, well, you know, we can't really advertise, you know, that this toothpaste is going to make your teeth whiter because they all do. So what they did was they began to um, show on on uh, commercials that brands would do more, that they would fulfill certain kind of needs and expectations that were almost spiritual in nature. So you're wearing a pair of shoes and suddenly you can just do it, right? And Starbucks.
becomes that third place between home and the office. So it's like you're, you know, it's your home away from home where you can do work. It's actually better than the home and the office because you can drink coffee there, right? And so these brands began to do this and invest their products in the minds of consumers with a potential that was really almost spiritual in, in, uh, in nature. And what's the beauty of that? Well, it never fulfills the spiritual need. And what is the spiritual? You know, what is the need that they're fulfilling? Well, you want to find meaning and you want to find community. And so people found community and meaning. Just think of Apple, right? Does Apple have a community? Oh, absolutely. Meaning? Hey, I'm, th that's, a, that's a map right there. Do you know where I went the week st Steve Jobs died? I, I felt a loss. I went to the Apple store in San Diego near my home. And you know what was strewn in front? Apples and flowers. And I, I felt something emotional. Oddly enough, I never met the man. I used his products. You know, I never met him. So there, there is something, something very much to this. And what the Obama campaign was able to do was to tap into that. Because whenever you look at, you know, you saw Apple, you can really, and actually a terrific, a terrific uh, exercise for you is to take some of the big brands and go, all right, let me, let me try um, Nike, all right? And I'm going to try to find their creation story and their words and their images and their rituals. And, and you go on. You can do it. Uh, Oprah Winfrey, you can do it. You know? And any of these big brands, that's how they sustain that connection with you. And that's how they keep you coming back. Okay? And, and that's how I believe Barack Obama is going, is going to work to bring um, his voting base back. Not a campaign, a movement. I like how you define <coughs> religion <coughs> as the building of community and meaning. Yeah. It's much more broad and inclusive. and doesn't divide people. Mm -hmm. e exactly, exactly. And, uh, and Barack Obama came as a unifier. He came as this post-partisan candidate, and so he was able to pull everyone under that umbrella of hope and change and belief. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, um, it's, I think you might have touched on it, it's not necessarily new to the political sphere because I think even about images, I remember George W. Bush uh, in his flight jacket standing on the aircraft carrier, you know, mission accomplished over him. Uh, Sarah Palin showed up 2008, late 2008 as a vice president. She had a very big um, following and kind of explosive entrance. Even Michelle Bachman, when she went into the race, she, she kind of upset a little bit. Even uh, Governor Perry, when he jumped in, in, you know, in the last year in the whole primary thing. But I think what Obama was able to do, he was able to, they were able to brand him as a genuine candidate. Because the rest of them, they, they had their time, but it went down so quick and you know they're just they're kind of out there now but he was able to uh, sink in and make a foundation that was able to build and was able to sustain I think even about in the uh, book of Acts um, I don't remember what chapter it was I was trying to look it up but they had they was persecuting the apostles Peter and those and uh, the Pharisees or whoever had brought them to trial and one of the older scribes or Pharisees he said you know Listen, I've seen a lot of things. I've seen different groups. We had this person, they rose up and they tried to lead the Jews and make their own nation. And this person came along and tried to do a revolt. We've seen this group come up and said, they all failed and they all you know, tumbled down. But now these fellows, if they be of God, if the tr God is truly behind them, if they truly have something that's deeper than just an emotional appeal or just a sensation, it's not going to be able to stop them. You can try to beat them, you can try to kill them, you can try to squash them, but you're not going to stop them. When something as, when an idea, when a movement that its time has come, you can't stop it. So I think that's really what he's, I don't, I don't necessarily think of him as like a religious, you know, he's God, but, you know, he's tapped into something a lot deeper than most politicians can ever Can, I, can I play off of that a little bit? The, the, very perceptive, what's your name? Hudson, Hudson Pitts. Hudson, very perceptive. Um, let's, let's talk about, you know, you talk about um, Michelle Bachman and Perry and these others coming in. Who has the brand in that in, in on the conservative side? 
Okay, who has the brand? The Tea Party has the brand. All right, let's stop that Tea Party. Create what's the Tea Party's creation story? It varies. It could have been, you know, it could have been started by Ron Paul. You could say where Rick Santelli had that rant uh, on, on C-SPAN on the floor of the, of the uh, stock exchange. Did you see this? Okay. Or there apparently was a uh, there was a student <coughs> that started a uh, she called it the Porculus uh, uh, what do you call it? rally. Okay. So it could have it, it, it's apocryphal, right? It could have started with any of us, but it has a creation story. What are the Tea Party sacred words? Liberty, freedom, independence, right? And the Constitution. So you, you hear that in a lot of the rhetoric on the right, on the conservative side. What are their images? Tea Party images. The flag, don't tread on me, right? The Gadsden flag. They carry it, they carry it at, the, at the rallies. Um, how about their rituals? What, you attend the rallies? If you sign up, if, if you, have you done any exploration of the Tea Party? Fascinating. I've signed up for a few of these. See what to, I'm signed up for everything. I get Barack Obama sends me letters, and, and uh, Tea Parties are sending me letters. You get on this, suddenly you're involved in a whole subculture, and, and, you're go, and, and they want you to come to, to all of their rituals, their rallies. They want you to be involved online. And, and, you're, and then you become a true, true believer. They, these folks they're are true, true believer, true believer by continuing to come. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, and they're they're dedicated. These are dedicated folks. Um, you know, and, and and what they're missing though is the final is the last the number six of charismatic leader. They're they're missing two things. I mean, they, they, Go they, ahead. The um, if I were to make a contrast, and yeah, we've talked. I got questions, but sure. Uh, but even accepting the framing, one of the big differences between what you presented and what I would paint as the Tea Party fix is that the Tea Party messages are apocalyptic. Mm -hmm. They're not salvific. Mm -hmm. and, and so the reason you don't have a charismatic leader is they haven't bridged the next stage. I mean, you need somebody to say, save us from this, and all they got is, we're all gonna die. <laughs> and 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 I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to demean their sincerity, but there is no rhetorical device there um, on, upon which one could could build a long-term movement. So, so that's that's one of the. I want to come back to the, the notion about the intersection of sort of time, social trend, and and, and charismatic personality. Playing a little bit of what this would say that it. It seems to me, if I were to think back over my lifetime, I, I go back and I pick up, there are similar patterns that happen with Kennedy's election, with Reagan's election, and with Obama's election. Okay. But all three of them are times where the nation was in some kind of major transition, disruption, threat, and you get a charismatic leader who steps in and says, we're better than all this stuff. We can rise above all this stuff. Kennedy's harder to deal with. I mean, you've got to try to imagine Kennedy, you know, in 62 and not after 63. But, because that one gets all distorted in right. memory. But but even the young guy got elected, the new Catholic, the new day, the new Kennedy, <coughs> that is all there. In And I think those three are similar. And Clinton had flashes of that, but the timing wasn't right. I mean, there wasn't the same kind of, we're down and we're up. Uh, you know, so you don't get Messiah type language because you haven't set the stage for that the way you do with Reagan, uh, the way you do with Kennedy, Reagan, and uh, and Obama. And if you want an example of the absence of everything I just said, and I, if he really, in retrospect, was a good president, but George Herbert Walker Bush has no brand whatsoever because he just took on and tried to carry on after the charismatic guy, and they had nothing. And they kept saying, where's the vision thing? It, so there's, there's something about that intersection of kind of national current and the rise of somebody who can step above that. Yeah, I think you're, you're picking up on what, what Paul said. And that, you know, none of this is, it, it's new in the sense that it's 
now conflated with advertising. Yeah, yeah. Which has evolved, continuing to evolve right. to more efficient levels. I mean, ah, probably efficient, efficient. Although Morning in America was a game changer in terms of political yeah. impact. But that was also, yeah, but it was also, it was also <coughs> the second, it was also a re-election theme. So, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, when, 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 see, and that's the, I guess that would be the point of differentiation, as you, as you mentioned, 1962-63, after, after uh, Kennedy was assassinated, that's when Camelot was, was envisioned, because that's what Jackie wanted. Right. You know, um, and so you have kind of his mythos being created after the fact. I need to go back and look at the 80, at the 80 campaign, because I do think you get Iranian hostages, oil prices. Oh yeah, it was, a, it was a desperate all situation. All this stuff sure. against Carter, and then you get it's morning in America. But yeah. morning in America, technically, I, I, I'm you get a body of resurrected optimism. Yes, which yeah. is what Reagan did in 1980. Yes, yes. Uh, his landslide yes. shocked me. But I would also add that uh, 1912 election of Woodrow Wilson. Uh, what the point would be from my perspective 100 years ago is that in terms of the, the evolution of the efficiency and effectiveness of advertising, mm -hmm. the, even the evolution of the effective use of the camera, mm -hmm. you know, to compare what's happening and what they were doing in 2008 with nine, even 1980, mm -hmm. uh, uh, students just be look, looking at how they're uh, able to unleash the power of technical changes right. which are increasing and continue to draw the eye. The, the evolution of storytelling videographically, uh, uh, there, there's no comparison. But I would say in terms of the charismatic figure that maybe matched uh, uh, Reagan and Obama, and Kennedy was Woodrow Wilson mm -hmm. prior to and, a lot of the and evolution and communication. I put FDR on the list too. Yes, 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 yes. Sure. We haven't even gotten into the whole topic of social media. But when you when you look at things that you could attribute to just being elected four years ago, I mean, I don't know how many people use Twitter in here, but if you if you were to uh, search for Obama on Twitter. He's got 13 million followers. There's not a single only Republican candidate that has over a million. Now, some of that is voter base related because Republicans have much more rural areas, so there's not as much technology that's that used there. But they made phenomenal, masterful use of social media to help him get elected. Oh, I, and, I, and I predict he will surpass Kim Kardashian <laughs> this, this election season on Twitter. By the way, five more minutes. Well, and, and Michelle has her own. She just came out with her own Twitter now, and and uh, and look how he's using it. Really, you, you, you mentioned Paul mentioned earlier about um, how you know about his marriage and how attractive that is. Well, what is he doing on Twitter? He's sending Valentine's greetings to his wife. He's asking for voters to send birthday uh, birthday wishes. You know, send, send, sign this birthday card. You know, for everybody in the in, in the administration. That fosters, a, you know, a relationship, yeah. and, and and then out of that comes an allegiance, you know. And so it's the nation. It's it's really the metaphor of the nation as a family, right? We send our sons to war. We have founding fathers. We've got the daughters <coughs> of the revolution, right? It's that it's that operative metaphor. And if if you know. When you when you heard that you know Hillary was throwing was throwing objects at Bill, you get like nervous. Like that's we don't want a divorce in the White House. That's awful, right? And there's there's that instability. We don't hear any of that. It's, it's very comforting to know that your president has a solid marriage and that he loves his kids. Absolutely. Do you believe branding can crumble? Um, Great question. That is that is what we're going to see. Uh, whether or not it can be effective the second time through. Now it's going to have to change because Barack Obama now has a record and he has a record that he either has to defend or he has to dispel and, and essentially blame others for what he wasn't able to do. And, and that's what you find him doing. You know, it's, it's 
the fault of Congress or the Republicans or the one percenters. And, it's, and he has these high-minded goals um, would have been put into effect except that there were these barriers. And so he's, you know, he's an embattled messiah now. But he's still really, I think, the same, uh, working on that same persona. It was interesting. Did you see that? that, that uh, let me run back to it. Where am I going? Oh, I'm going forward. Pardon me. There. That was, this was at Cannon Falls, uh, right, when he, right after he announced his, his uh, bid for re-election, that he was going to campaign. And it was, it was an incredible image um, on C-SPAN because it was Barack Obama from the waist up, in white, uh, trees gently flowing, river behind him. And he was talking to a, you know, a group. And it was, all I could think about was, that's the Jordan, come and cross over to the Promised Land. It was Joshua, it was Jesus, and that was the image that came to my mind. Now, that was, that's, that's in my background. That's, that's how, I, how I think. Um, the next message that you saw, a visual message, was he's in front of a big red barn with hay bales. It's morning in America. You know, and so he's using, so as you watch Barack Obama, watch where he's positioned, watch the, uh, the circumstances, watch the, the props that surround him, um, watch his environment, listen to his words, and, and see the response of, of people. You know, follow him on Twitter, follow him, in, uh, and follow all the candidates. If, you're, if, if you want, you follow them from an advertising perspective, because it's really interesting. Let's give a hand.